looking at a photograph of a U.S. Army soldier of the 1880s on the rifle range. He is in the Creedmoor position, the equivalent of our prone position today, and used for shooting at over 600 yards. The 1870s and 80s saw the growth in the U.S. and Britain of a feverish interest in rifle marksmanship. Almost all rifle matches included stages of fire at 600, 800, and 1,000 yards. High scores would indicate that all rounds at 1,000 yards had fallen into a bullseye three feet in diameter. By the 1880s, the scoring rings were consistently being shrunk, and high scores indicated still higher standards of marksmanship. Long-range rifle fire was not a trick and was put to use in the American West. The most famous incident of long-range shooting occurred in June 1874 at the Battle of Adobe Walls in the Texas Panhandle. In this battle, 24 buffalo hunters had been trapped in a cluster of adobe buildings by a war party of Indians. In the lull after two unsuccessful attacks, a group of Indians were seen sitting on their ponies on a bluff. A buffalo hunter by the name of Billy Dixon took his 50-90 Sharps rifle, adjusted his sights, and fired a shot, toppling one of the Indians from his horse. That shot ended the Battle of Adobe Walls. The distance from Dixon's position to the Indian was later surveyed and found to be 1,538 yards. It may have been a lucky shot, but it was certainly a shot that could only have been made with the proper rifle used by the proper individual. This was the Sharps long range buffalo rifle. While some Westerners wanted compatibility of ammunition between their rifle and their revolver and were willing to sacrifice range to get it, there was a large number of Westerners and Eastern target shooters who wanted long range effectiveness. For this long range effectiveness, they paid a price in a slightly reduced volume of fire, greater weight of the weapon, and more money spent on ammunition consumed in practice. The practice was required because muzzle velocities were still low. Combat ranges were about 160 yards battle sight and 400 adjust sight. Beyond this, range estimation became more and more critical. At ranges of 1,000 yards, for example, range estimation had to be very tight, and normally the shooter had to re-zero his rifle for that range. With the 45 and 50 caliber bullets involved, this re-zeroing could be done by watching the impact of the bullet. A shooter could put one or two rounds in the dirt in front of a buffalo herd, readjust his sights, and then begin dropping buffalo. It is against this background that a series of developments took place in the 1880s and 90s. The first development was smokeless powder. This was nothing more than the harnessing of nitroglycerin and nitrocellulose in a solid form. Though black powder and smokeless powder may look the same, they are vastly different. Smokeless powder had far more energy per unit weight and per volume than did black powder. Further, by controlling the composition and the size of the granules of the powder, its burning rate could be controlled and therefore tailored to any application at hand. This development meant that muzzle velocities far in excess of those attained with black powder were now possible. But if the large bore cartridges were used, then the recoil from large bullets being launched at high velocities would be far beyond what the average man could withstand. Consequently, the introduction of smokeless powder caused an immediate reduction in bore sizes from the 45 caliber range down to the 30 caliber range. As the bores became smaller and velocities higher, the naked lead bullet could not withstand the heat and pressure of launch. This brought about new bullets where the lead did not touch the bore. Two Swiss, Schmidt and Rubin, came up with the first practical jacketed bullets. A jacketed bullet is just as you see here, a gilding metal envelope surrounding a lead core. 
The lead gives the bullet weight and density, while the jacket gives strength and keeps the lead from touching the bore. The same two individuals, along with numerous others, were working on new systems of storing cartridges within the weapon. The French, after the adoption of smokeless powder, had simply necked down their old black powder cartridge case to 8 millimeter Lebel and put it in a weapon that was only a slight improvement from their basic Chasse and Grosse design. Their rifle even included a tubular magazine. Schmidt and Rubin, along with a number of others, such as Monlicker of Austria and Mauser of Germany, wanted to store the cartridges one on top of the other so that the nose of the bullet of one cartridge would not be pressing against the primer of the next cartridge. To this end, Schmidt and Rubin made the sides of the cartridge case parallel so that they would stack neatly and eliminated the rim on the cartridge. The rim of the cartridge was normally what the extractor worked upon, so they turned an extractor groove in the base of the cartridge. The rimless cartridge was born, and the box magazine, where cartridges are stacked one on top of the other, was now practical. Monlicker decided that if a box magazine could be had, then it no longer be loaded with individual cartridges. He created the Monlicker clip loading system, or what we now call the N-block clip. In this system, the weapon itself had the magazine follower and follower spring. The N-block clip, holding anywhere from three to six cartridges, was pressed into the weapon from the top and retained in it. The N-block clip held the cartridges and provided the feed lips, while the rifle provided the follower and follower spring. After firing the last shot, the Monlicker clip simply dropped out the bottom of the rifle, the soldier inserted a new clip of rounds from above, and was ready to fire. By 1893, Mauser had improved this still further by discarding the single column, that is cartridges stacked one above the other, and creating the staggered double column box magazine. The advantage to this was that the magazine was wholly within the rifle and virtually immune from handling damage. Further, the feed lips were milled into the steel of the receiver, thereby being much stronger than the flimsy sheet metal of the end block clips. In order to load this magazine rapidly, Mauser designed the stripper clip. This clip holds five rounds and is inserted into the weapon from above. The rounds are then pushed into the magazine and the stripper clip discarded. While all this development was going on, one should remember that cartridge cases were constantly being made stronger. Further, the metallurgical industry and the machine tool industry were enjoying rapid advances in the 1880s and 90s. Alloy steels were being introduced, and man's knowledge of heat treatment of steel was improving. The improvements in the machine tool industry meant that products could be made in larger quantity and with much greater precision. Without going into the history of specific weapons, the industrialized nations of the world all had magazine-fed bolt-action rifles of one sort or another by the 1890s. One might ask, however, the black powder breech loaders were regularly shooting to a thousand yards, what advantage did the bolt action have over them? Watch the following scene carefully, see if you can spot the advantages.
the sharp-eyed among you will have picked out two things. The first was the charger loading of the bolt-action magazine rifle. The other factor is more subtle, though perhaps more important. You should have seen that out to 330 yards, the bolt-action magazine rifle fired from battle site, while the black powder breech loader had to adjust sights. This is due to a number of factors. The bolt action was much stronger and could withstand higher pressures. This, coupled with smokeless powder, jacketed bullets, and stronger cartridge cases meant much higher muzzle velocities. On the chart, this difference becomes obvious. The volume of fire with the bolt action magazine rifle is roughly double that of the single shot black powder breech loader while its battle sight and adjust sight range is greatly improved. Initially, this was roughly double the breech loader. By the turn of the century, man became better educated as to aerodynamics, and the bullets changed from the heavy round nose that you see on the left to the lighter, higher velocity Spitzer bullets, which were also much more aerodynamically efficient. This resulted in the total difference, a rough tripling of battle sight and adjust sight range. This is an extremely important point, and I'd like to illustrate this with two other methods. This next chart shows the drop of four different bullet cartridge combinations. The first curve is a 45 caliber bullet at black powder velocities. Notice how much flatter the curve is when the same bullet is fired at the smokeless powder velocities of the 1890s and 1900s. The first curve, by the way, is the 4570 rifle. The third curve is a round nose 30 caliber bullet, which is aerodynamically inefficient but fired at smokeless powder velocities. The fourth curve is a bullet of the same weight at the same velocity, but using a Spitzer boat tail, a very aerodynamically efficient bullet. By the way, this fourth curve is the curve for the M14 rifle and M60 machine gun. Let's put these curves to practical use. I have here a series of targets. One set of targets was fired with the 4570, the second with the 30 6 They duplicate the first and fourth curves you just saw. Both rifles are equipped with telescopic sights, and both rifles were fired from a shooter's bench rest, as you see here. The purpose of the bench rest and the telescopic sight is to eliminate as much human error as possible so as to better illustrate the trajectories of the weapons involved. Both rifles were zeroed so as to take maximum advantage of their battle sight ranges. From that point, each rifle was fired at 100 yards and at 330 yards, aiming in all cases between the breast pockets of the enemy. You can see that both rifles did well at 100 yards. But at 330 yards, the 30 6 was still at battle site, while the bullets from the 4570 had fallen dramatically. This illustrates the point. The more highly curved the trajectory, the more critical range estimation becomes. What did all this mean? It meant that the shooter, for an equal amount of training, could be more deadly at longer ranges in a combat situation. At 350 yards or less, he simply fired battle sight at the highest rate that he could manipulate his weapon. Lastly, the volume of fire was now getting high enough to the point where men no longer need stand shoulder to shoulder. They could be spread out in skirmish line and still generate sufficient volume of fire to stop any sort of mass charge. All of this happened well within the career length 
of an officer of the day. It frequently occurred that lieutenants who gained their experience with single shot black powder breech loaders would go off the staff and, after numerous promotions, would come back to command units equipped with weapons beyond anything they had ever dreamed of. A good example of the effect of this on the battlefield is the Boer War. In this war, the British initially attempted to fight with stand-up formations and mass charges. They were quickly slaughtered by the Boers. In the few times when the British did make a night attack or achieved some other advantage, such as their seizure of Spion Kop, the Boers could easily form skirmish line and pour murderous rifle fire into the British from extremely long range. This picture shows the British dead in a trench on Spion Kop after the trench was enfiladed by rifle fire from another hilltop nearly 1,000 yards away. This is the real comparison of the single-shot black powder breech loader with the smokeless powder magazine-fed bolt-action rifle. You will study the ideas of Dupic and de Grand Maison and the ensuing history of World War I. When you do, remember the changes that occurred from 1886 to 1905. You should ask yourself, how fast does man learn when times change? How fast will you learn as times change now?